decision to make the change in ourselves. And when we find that that change changes our outlook on things, it gives us hope and purpose and security, it makes the hard work that we had to do to change our direction worthwhile. So that's what we're going to look into next week. And it's a uh, seven-part series, actually maybe nine-part series, but it's in Numbers 11 through 14, talking about the Israelites and what we can learn from them. So uh, looking forward to that and can't wait to start that next week. We are currently in our uh, current series of Who I Am. You remember we talked about that. It wasn't because I knocked my head and I didn't know who I was. It's because who am I? Who am I compared to? to the great I am. We know that's what God's name is, right? That's how he declared his, uh, himself to Moses. Who should I send, say sent me? Moses said to him, and he said, tell him the I am did. The I am who was in the past, in the present, and is in the future. Where do we find our worth? We've, we talked about last week when we began to look at that when we compare ourselves to God, we can compare ourselves to our neighbor and say, well, I'm not as sinful as they are. I can compare myself to anything. And we, we talked about Chris's theory of relativity. Remember, everything is relative to what you compare it to. And if we really look at our lives and we're going to compare it to God Almighty, who are we? Who am I? Who am I as compared to the great I am? Because the only one we should be comparing ourselves is the followers of Jesus is to Jesus himself, who in turn is the same as God the Father. So when we compare ourselves to who he is, there is no comparison. And remember David said in Psalm 8, what is man that you should be mindful of him? Who are we to God? When you look down at an anthill, who, those ants could look up and say, who are we that you're actually paying attention to us? Not that we look like ants to God. But you get my message. You get my, my picture that I'm painting. Who are we? And so if the only one, with a capital O, we as Christ followers should compare ourselves as God, then how do we demonstrate and live out that humility? So last week we were in verses 1 through 11 in Philippians 2. So if you want to turn there, we're going to continue now and finish out Philippians 2, verses 12 to 30. Last week, we identified what the epitome of humility was. It was Jesus, right? Well, let's look at how we demonstrate. We looked at how we demonstrate that humility in our lives. We said last week, first, that the evidence of our humility is the unity of our body, how we get along with one another, and the way you get along with people is you think of them greater than yourselves, not you as better than them. So each person seeing others as more important than themselves by loving one another, working together, and being united in one mind and one purpose. We also identified what the method of hu humility was, showing selflessness, treating others as more important than ourselves, self-unimportance, seeing and treating others as greater than you, and then other others-centeredness we looked at, which means rather than focusing on our own interest, do we sacrifice our wants and needs for the wants and needs of others. So today, let's begin in verse 12 of Philippians 2, and we'll read uh, 12 and 13. Dear friends, you also followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So Paul started out in verses 1 to 11, and he says, who should you, how do we create unity? Because we're one body in Christ. We create that unity by humility. And how, what do we judge that humility by? We judge that humility by Jesus himself, that he left his throne and he came down here, gave up, he abdicated the throne, gave up his power, he was both God and man, but gave up being one with God to come down here as a baby, as we, as we talked about on Christmas Eve, as a baby in a manger, in a feeding trough. He, he humbled himself to do that. And now, we're gonna, now he continues to the Philippians and he says, when I was with you, you followed my instructions. And so now I would like that you, now that I'm away, it's even more important. How about parents and children? It's important that your kids 
listen to you when you're with them, but isn't it more important that they obey all the rules you set up for them when you're not with them? That's the same thing he's saying in the Philippians. And he says, now how you do that? Well, you have to work hard to show the results of your salvation. So the first way of exercising and showing our humility, and this is a little bit of a different fill-in, isn't it? All right, get my thing to cooperate. Experiencing Christ through humble obedience. Experiencing Christ through humble obedience. Now, if you've been on our website, you'll notice that ECHO is echo. And if next slide, would you, Josh? That's what it that's a snapshot on our website. And you'll see there I have it at the top, we have it at the top, we have it at the bottom. Experiencing Christ through humble obedience. That is our vision. Our mission is teaching others to know and be known by Christ. So the day you get there and you meet Jesus, he knew you. He doesn't say, be gone, I never knew you. That's my responsibility, that all of you sitting in these chairs, when you meet Jesus, he says he knew you. You can go through your entire life and think you know Jesus, but does he know you? Do you have a relationship with him? So the mission is to lead others to to know and to be known, but our vision then is experiencing Christ through humble obedience. you haven't seen that before go on our website it's all over the website because i want people to know that that's they come to echo valley that's it's that's what we want to put forth because if we're following christ with humble obedience we're right where god wants us to be not thinking of ourselves better than anyone else not looking down on anyone else but working in unity together it wasn't meant to be clever although it it is It wasn't meant to be clever. It was meant to send a clear message of how and what we do here. Because truly, to grow in our relationship with him, Paul says we have to work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. You may have a translation that says working out your salvation in fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean we have any part in our salvation. So don't think that's what that means. But you have to do anything to make yourself safe. Jesus wouldn't have come and given up his life if there was another way or anything else we needed to do. But what it does mean is that when we realize the example of humility that he took and Christ showed us, that we in turn must show the results of that humility on our part by living with his same attitude. And the fear and trembling, don't get that wrong. That doesn't mean you need to cower and, and shake. Fear and trembling, not being afraid, it is reverence and awe and thanksgiving and obedience. Seeing God in that way. Fear does not mean being afraid. It means having reverence for God and all of who he is. Titus 3, 1 to 2 says this, Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they must be gentle and show true humility to everyone. That's not always easy, is it? Even in our society, let alone the society back then in the Greek society, even in our society, to be humble appears that we're weak. We don't want to appear weak. We don't want to be walked on. We don't want someone to take advantage of us. Or do we? Ask yourself that. Or do we? If you're a follower of Jesus, he said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They treated me badly, they're going to treat you badly. That's not really an advertisement for Christianity, is it? Come be a Christian and get walked on because you need to be humble. Now that isn't what it means. But we do need to live out our humility by showing it in all we do, obeying those who are placed in authority of us, over us. Be gentle and show true humility to everyone. If, if this whole room walked around in our everyday lives and we showed humility, it should stand out like a sore thumb, like a zit on your cheek. It should stand out. 
because we're not going to be like anybody else. Remember, the rest of the world is, I'm going to be on top. Dog eat dog world, right? We talked about the driving. Some people were listening to me last week. We're talking about driving, getting frustrated with the people who are in front of you or cut you off or pull out in front of you and drive at 20 miles an hour. That happens. And it's hard to be humble in those moments, isn't it? John MacArthur says it this way. Submission to authority of scripture demands submission to human authorities as part of the Christian testimony. We don't always like what our government says, do we? We, and, and if someone in our party isn't the president, we don't like that person. Just because he's not our, in our party and, and we want him, but we still have to listen to him. Because you know why? God put them in place. Whether we like them or not, whether they vote the way we want them to, whether they make laws that we like or not, God placed them there. King after king after king after king in the Old Testament were put in place and you might ask yourself, why? The Israelite kings, there's so many, there were far more bad kings than there were good ones. But they were all placed there, and God places them for, for a purpose. He also tells us in Romans 13, 1 to 7, he calls us to obey governing authorities placed over us by God. But scripture gives one exception to that, and I want to make sure, that's why I'm, I'm talking about Romans here. That one exception to obeying authority over us is when they ask us, that obedience to civil authority would require disobedience to God's word. That's when we do not, we are not called on that we have to obey. We are to show our testimony by the way we live our lives. We need to live them like Jesus did. Now you're going to say to me, Pastor Chris, I'm not Jesus. I'm not perfect. I sin all the time. Dave said he needs that forgiveness more than anybody. I don't know that I, I need it just as much as he does. How about you? It's not easy to live our lives as a testimony. That's a scary thought. Wow, people are watching me. So maybe I just won't make it evident I'm a Christian. Then they won't know I'm supposed to be doing anything different. Maybe they won't be judging me on this higher level. 1 John 2.6 says, Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. I grew up in the time of what would Jesus do, the bracelets, right? I say now, we don't need to wonder what Jesus would do. We know what he did. It should be, what did Jesus do? It's all here. It's all written in here. What did Jesus do? That's what we need to be looking at. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. John MacArthur says, the reason for practicing a holy manner of living is that Christians are associated with the holy God and must treat him and his word with respect and reverence. We therefore glorify him best by being like him. You want to glorify God? Act like him. Be humble. Follow his word. Be obedient. People are watching us. They are. You may not think they are, but they are. They're looking to see how and why we're different. Are we know-it-alls? Are we blowhards? Are we reflecting the attitudes and, or are we reflecting the mannerisms of Christ? It's going to be evident. If somebody walked in here with a, an outfit that had lights all over it, they'd be different than everyone in here. I just made that up on the moment. But they walked in here, it was evident they were different. We'd all see it. They would look different than all of us. Maybe they behave different than all of us. They would stand out. I used the, the, the Waldo, right? Looking in a crowd of people and trying to find Waldo. Well, maybe as a Christian, you need to be Waldo. You need to stand out, and, but not be hard to find. He doesn't find, hard to find. He has a striped outfit on. If you look hard enough, you find him. Are you standing out in the environments that you find yourself, in your work environment, with your friends? Are you standing out? What TV shows are you watching and then talking about with your coworkers? Where do you spend your free time? What local watering hole do, do we realize that we are creating a narrative of what a Christian looks like? I'm not saying can't go to a watering hole. I, was, I did not say that. What I said was, What's that saying about your testimony? 
Is it helping your testimony or is it hurting? You can answer that question. What message are we sending? If pressed, would, would they use our actions against us to say, you're no Christian, this is what you do. You're no better than I am, this is what you do. Would they do that? Because they will. That's what it says here. It says, don't do anything that they could come back to you and make an accusation against you. So that's, that's, that's hard. All right, let's, let's continue. Let's look at verses 14 through 16. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. We're called to shine like bright lights in a world. We should be emitting humility as an inextinguishable light. Emitting humility as an inextinguishable light. It's pretty clear that we are living in a world of crooked and perverse people. Do I hear an amen? Is that not pretty clear? You only have to turn the television on to find that out in the news, listen to the news. Who, the type of world we're living in. Shouldn't we stand out in every situation we find ourselves in? Do you fit in? Would those you work with or play with or socialize with, would they know that you and Christ are one? What did Jesus say about that? In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, he says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your, holy, your heavenly Father. When you act like Jesus, when you are humble like Jesus, when you are godly, people will notice. They will see it. And who does it bring glory to you? To God. That's who it brings glory to. Sure, you look the same today because you were once like the world. We still all look like the world in our physical bodies. But as redeemed children of God, we are his very own possession. See what Peter says. Now, I do have a wrong notation. If you're looking this up or you want to make a note, in, it is 1 Peter 2.9, not 1 Peter 3.8. That was a mistake on my part. So this is, I'm now going to be reading 1 Peter 2.9. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are our royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We were called out of the darkness of this world. We are to shine like inextinguishable lights, lights that can't be put out. If we conduct ourselves correctly, we will not ruin our testimony, and we will be a light that cannot be put out. This attitude of humility should fill us with joy, with amazing joy that we can represent Almighty God to everyone we come in contact with, glorifying him in our conduct and our humility. That should be a hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's keep uh, reading verses 17 and 18 of Philippians 2. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. As we show others what true humility looks like, it's like pouring out our sacrifice to God with our lives. It is exercising sacrificial humility with joy. Exercising sacrificial humility with joy. Let's look at it this way. When you walk around and your life is 
emitting an inextinguishable light and people see that you're different, you're making a sacrifice for God. Paul said back there that he was pouring it out like a liquid offering. Normally, the liquid offering would go first and then they would make their main offering. But what Paul's saying here is we give our lives a sacrificial life and then his would be pouring that offering on top of it. It would make all that he did in teaching them and preaching to them and leading them worthwhile to him. And his would be a, a, a drink offering, a, a liquid offering on top of the offering we give by our lives. A holy life that's lived for Christ is a holy sacrifice. An offering to God of our gratitude and our praise for all he has done for us. Has he done anything for you? Yeah, for all of us. Our humility honors his humility and brings glory to him. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, <coughs> Excuse me, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Joy, peace, and hope are the results of the sacrifice of humility. And, and let's all be honest, being humble in this world, being as hard as it is, if you do it, that's going to be a sacrifice. You're going to be giving of yourself. You're going to be saying, okay, walk on me because I'm going to not treat you back the way if I weren't a Christian, I would treat you. They're going to see that. So why isn't he reacting? Why isn't he doing this? Why, isn't, why aren't they doing that? Why isn't she doing this? They're going to want to know why. They're going to try other things to test you. And the more you hold and remain humble, because Jesus is humble, that's why you're doing it, that's going to change the people that you're around and you rub shoulders with every day. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 says this, Therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Let's get that right. Don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. That's what God wants us now in this day and age. We're not doing sacrifices. We're not sacrificing lambs on an on a altar. What he asks us for is to not forget to do good and to share with those in need. That's what, every time you do that, you're doing a sacrifice to God in thanksgiving, in joy, because of what he's done for you. Well, Paul goes on now to give us two more examples of what humility looks like for the follower of Christ. And these were people that the Philippians knew very well, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So we're going to look now at Timothy in verses 19 through 24. If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he will cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. These were other people that were there to help him in his ministry. They had all fallen away because they were all worried about their own lives, their own things going on. They, Timothy was the only one. Verse 22, but you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what's going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will see you soon. He does get released and he does get to go and see the Philippians. But at this point, he doesn't know if he's going to be let out of jail. Paul found himself surrounded by people who, as he puts it, care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. That was verse 21. Paul wasn't alone. He had one who was a kindred spirit, one who knew all that Paul had gone through and one who genuinely cared for the Philippians. So he had someone who exhibiting who was exhibiting humility with selfless care. Exhibiting humility with selfless care. He talked about being selfless instead of selfish. Giving of yourself. Well, this is an example of what Timothy did. In verse 20, Paul says he has no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about their welfare. 
who do we genuinely care about? Their welfare. Does someone come to your mind? Who do you genuinely care about? Is it a family member, a close friend? Who? Do we genuinely care about those in this room, in this body? Remember, unity, oneness in Christ is what Paul's speaking about in this entire chapter. How do we treat one another? How do we see one another? Are we willing to give of ourselves for the benefit of someone in this room? I think we do. I think we do. I think we all care very deeply about each other. I think there isn't anything that we wouldn't do for each other. Amen? Okay. How does that translate onto our non-Christian friends? Do we generally care for their welfare? 1 Thessalonians 5.11. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. That's each other. That's within the church. Proverbs 22.1 says, choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. When we're out in the world, what's the thing driving us? Is it the welfare of those we come in contact with? Can we bless them in some way? Could it be a pat on the back and be a hug when they're crying? How many times do we pass by people that Maybe it's even hard to tell what's going on in their lives. How often are we have things going on in our lives and we don't tell anyone, we keep it in? Uh, you might say, Pastor Chris, Paul is talking about his fellow believers in Philippi. I have enough to worry about besides always being there for those in the world. How's that? Is that a thought that's come in your mind? I got enough things to worry about in my own life. And, of course, I'll take care of those in the church, but don't ask me to come up with enough to take care of the world, too. But doesn't that show perfectly the humility of Christ? Won't your generosity, your caring, your loving attitude show them Christ? Yes, it will. Yes, we're to start with our brothers and sisters. Second Peter 1, 5 to 7 says, In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance. Boy, this is heavy. And patient endurance with godliness. And here we are and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Everyone. That brotherly affection with love and care is also for everyone, and this is exhibiting humility with selfless affection. Selfless care like Timothy and selfless affection like Epaphroditus. Paul gives a second example of selflessness in addition to care in the, affection, in the affection from Epaphroditus. Let's read 25 to 30. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in need. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I'm all the more anxious to send him back to you for I know you will be glad to see him and then I will not be worried about you, so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy. Give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. The Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to Paul and said, we can't be there with you in Rome, in prison, so we're going to send Epaphroditus to minister to you. They would allow people into the jail to take care of their needs. And so he went there, but while he was there, he became very sick and almost died. And Paul was very happy that God had spared him because that would have just been one more thing 
that he would have sorrow of that. But God didn't do that. But Epaphroditus, if, if you sent, one of us was sent and became very ill, how worried would you be? How are they doing it? We have people that are part of our body, right, who are sick and aren't able to be even be here today. We pray for them. We talk about them. We're worried about them. So now put this in context for the church of Philippi. They send someone and, and they don't hear anything. Then they hear he's very sick and almost dies and they don't hear almost died. And then they don't hear how he is. We would be worried sick. We're worried enough when we know how somebody is and how treatment is going. How is it for them? Paul was going to send this letter by the hand of Epaphroditus who eagerly wanted to get back to his church family. He was distressed that they knew he was ill and didn't know how he was. Timothy would go in Paul's absence after Paul ascertained when he might be released or have a trial. He hoped that Timothy would report back to him how the Philippian church was doing. Brotherly affection is an extension of our own familial affection for one another. So what am I saying? So an example of humility with selfless affection would be you having that type of selfless affection that we would have for one another in here for people outside the church. That again is going to point people to God. How, why are you helping me? They would ask. I've had people ask me that, and I said, it's because Jesus told me to. Because Jesus told me to. We're called to walk humbly before our God, loving others and showing kindness and justice when required. Micah 6.8 says this, He's told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's what we are called to do. Remember the sacrifice. That's your sacrifice. Every time you treat someone better than yourself, you're there for them as a shoulder to cry on. You're there for them to help them financially if they need it. You're there for them just to show them I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm not better than you. Do you know how much of the world thinks that we sit in here today and we think we're here because we think we're better than they are? Anybody you know who tells you that, tell them right away, oh, no, I'm as bad as you are. I just know where I'm going to find forgiveness. And the group, that's why you're all here. We know we're sinners, and we know we need forgiveness. Not that we're better than anyone else. We're not smarter. We've been blessed by the Holy Spirit to have been shown what we need to know. We're to have a selfless love and follow the example of Jesus. John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. <clears throat> is there someone that you would actually die for? Someone come to mind? Is it your spouse? Your children? Your parents. How about a stranger? Would you lay your life down for a stranger? It's a hard question. The girl at Columbine laid her life down for Jesus. I, and how many around the world were threatened with death if they read the Bible or they meet together for prayer? And they can be executed. But how about a stranger? Do you know what? While we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. We were strangers. We didn't know him. Now, if you look at who you would die for, our military do that every day. They may not die every day, but they're prepared to. They're prepared when they join the military, or they, and even if they're not sent out, to a foreign land, they're saying, if I'm called upon, I will die. And they're dying for us. We don't know them. We're strangers. They're willing to give their lives, and we reap the benefit from it. We're called to love others above ourselves, and in doing so, we grow in our understanding of God more and more 
and more. Colossians 1, 8 to 10 says, He's told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. So we've come to the end of chapter 2 of the Philippians. How should we process the message then that's below the surface? You can read the words, but what's the message below the surface? Because I'm going to tell you, most of the time in this book, there's far more below the surface. If you merely read the words, you're going to be blessed. But if you take time to figure out what is the meaning that's deep below, because you can dig and dig and dig and find more and more things that you didn't ever know before and didn't know what that meant. This is his main point, that unity of the church is paramount above all else. It requires humility, putting others above ourselves. And as we do that, we show the world what the love of Christ looks like. And when our actions remain godly and above reproach, we will keep the world from finding fault to damage our testimony. One of the most precious things you have as a follower of Christ is your testimony. Did you realize that? That's a precious gem. And that's what you're supposed to use to tell others about Christ. How your life has changed for the better. Love for our brothers and sisters is first. Our friends are next. And the world as we show the love of Christ. Before chapter 2, in Philippians 1.27, he sets this all up. Before he talks about unity of church, he says this, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. I could do a whole sermon just on this verse. When, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. That should be us. That should be us. And what do you take from that we're already citizens of heaven? Do you know you have, you've joined? We just went to a friend of ours who was born in Chile, just became an American citizen. We went and celebrated with him last night. Dear friend. I married the two of them. Uh, to, I married him to his wife, yes. And he has dual citizenship now. Do you know you all have dual citizenship? You all live down here, and you remember, you, you, if I assume you all are American citizens, but you're also citizens of heaven. Do you live, do you call upon that? There's, there's something that comes along with that, right? We've been blessed by Jesus Christ. What do you do with that? Do you live like you're a citizen of heaven? Does it make a difference in how you live your life, how you see others, how you conduct yourself? We should do it in a way that's worthy of the good news about Christ. There's no greater thing that we could do. So I really want you to see your testimony for what it is. Live your life out as best as you can and call upon the Holy Spirit for help when you can't. None of us in here are perfect. I'm not saying you have to be because the Holy Spirit knows you're not perfect. But if you call upon him, you rely on him, you ask him to to speak through you, to, to, to take over your thoughts, you will naturally become more like Christ. You can't. You wouldn't be able to help it. That Philippians 127 sums up all we need to know. If we live as citizens of heaven, then the only outcome can be to point the world to Christ as God. Standing together, unified, fighting together, this will change the world. Let me ask you, do you want to change the world? Or you sit there and go, well, I don't have any power to change the world. 
I can't do anything. Yeah, we can. If we all came together and the church up the street came together and the body of Christ came together, we could change the world. Now, I know you'll say, I read Revelation, and I just sat through Tom's, Tom's class. I know what happens in the end. Yes, we've read the book, and we know how it ends. But we don't know there can't be a revival today and that we could be part of it. We don't know when that end of, of our time is going to be. What are we doing with it? Are we sitting back and, uh, in a sleigh being pulled by horses, and we're just like waiting until we get to the end of the, of the way? Or are you looking for the people that you can get, as many people as you can get on that sleigh as you can, heading to heaven? So I'm going to ask you, are you showing the humility of Christ in your life? Not just in here. We're all on our best behavior in here. Are you showing the humility of Christ outside these doors? With who you interact with in your job, with your friends, where you play, are you showing the humility of Christ? I'm going to have you tell me now. There's no slide that's going to be telling you this. The four verses that you can use to witness to anybody. Isaiah 59, 2. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Romans 3, 23. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6, 23. See, but he even makes it easy. 3, 23, 6, 23. For the of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 10, 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and, and what? Believe? Believe or confess. Sorry, we have different versions in there. Okay. Believe or confess. If you believe or confess in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, not might be, you will be saved. That belief portion is the, is the hard part. It's having that faith. Because you can just say, yeah, I believe, and then go about your life just the way it was prior to saying that. And you're not going to be saved. Because there has to be a change in your life. And part of that change would be having the humility of Christ in your life. When you start seeing yourself like, lesser than those around you and not wanting your own way and wanting the best for other people, that's when you're going to have evidence of the epitome of humility, Jesus Christ, that you have that in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have in your word and how it, it, an onion you can peel away layer after layer after layer. And this was a letter from Paul to the, peop to the church in Philippi whom he loved and who he was leading from afar. And he knew, Lord, that the only way for them to thrive and to grow would be to put their reliance in you and to come together, unified, put differences aside, see others as lesser than themselves, to sacrifice, have their lives be a sacrifice for you. And in so doing, the world would see it and be changed. And for generations and generations, that's happened. So, Lord, we pray to you that you would use our lives, use our lives as a living sacrifice so that we would bless the world for you, that you would be blessed by our living sacrifice. The next time we see someone in our lives, Lord, help us to see them like you see them. We, we know what you did. Help us to do the same. Lord, I thank you for everyone in here who has heard this, and I ask you to have it be a fire that burns in their belly to find a way to become more like you and more humble like you, Lord, myself included. We love you and we praise you, Lord, and we look forward to what you're going to do in our lives for you. In Jesus' name.